All right, we're going to get going here. Um, this will be the last call for the bonus problems, if you did the bonus problems. And it was actually brought to my attention that on 11.8, Hold on. One of the bonus problems, oh, here it is, this one. I I had Mathematica computed these distances for me, and I had the right points in there, but in my formula for computing the distance, I messed up one of the signs or something. And so what appears on your notes, it says here, what, like two point something? Something like that? Two point something. This is what it should be, 5.3. Now I asked I asked for the points on the sphere. I didn't ask for these distances, so um you know, hopefully if you got the points correctly, everything will uh work out. But uh, just a correction there. Okay? Um would you mind shutting the door while you're since you're standing up? And then uh let's kill at least one of these lights. Okay, now I'm also going to run through something quickly. I don't want to waste too much time on this. Uh, not waste time, but invest too much time on this. But I had an excellent question by one of your classmates asking, why does Lagrange multipliers work? Like, why is it that, what did Lagrange multipliers say? It said that if we can find the places where the gradient of f is equal to lambda gradient of g, that if we can find out where that happens, that that's where we'll have maximums and minimums, right? So the question was why? You know, what? why is the relationship between the gradients um, going to basically give us that max min? So I put together a, a demonstration. Hopefully you can follow it. It's a tough concept to get your head around if you just, like, first time you think about it. So just see how this goes. Now, remember also, God, I told myself, no more than than seven minutes on this. You're given a function f of x, y. You're given a constraint g of x, y equals k, right? So what I said is the g, you move all the x, y stuff to the left, you leave a constant on the right. And this g function is a function, isn't it? It's It's a surface. G of X, Y is a surface. And so we can find a gradient of that surface. So that's what we're going to work on here. This was our first example I did last class. Here's the function. Here's the constraint. So G in this problem is X squared plus Y squared. Right? That is the graph of G. Right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm now going to show you what G is constrained or, or set equal to 1. If you set g equal to 1, which is this equation right here, g equal to 1, then all you get is what we call a level curve of that surface. It's just that circle right there. Okay? That's it. And since those are just a bunch of points on that surface, we have gradients. And the gradient is a vector that sticks out of the surface. Do you all see it? You can spin that around. You see that vector? That's our gradient vector. Now, that gradient vector is actually parallel to the xy plane. So if I look at it from the side... Not that side. There, from the side, you can see the gradient vector is actually parallel to the xy plane. With me? Now, the next thing I'd like to do to try and help motivate why this all works is to take that green circle, right, and just map it down to the xy plane. So let's just drop it down there real quick. Boom, boom. Okay, there it is. I've taken it, I've dropped it down so you can see it on the ground, you can see the gradient. I actually ran a tangent to it also. And then over here, in, I have a 2D graph that's showing just the XY plane. You'll see it? Okay, now we move along. I'm going to take that circle up here out, because we've got it on the ground already. I'm actually now going to pull the G function out of the picture. We're not even looking at G anymore, okay? But that vector right there is the gradient of G, isn't it? restricted to that circle. <sighs> While I'm here, let me let me talk a little bit about when we're restricting f to that or constraining f to that 
g of x, y equals k, what we're saying is, is the points we can plug in, the x and y's, must live on this circle, right? So if I'm moving along this circle, do you agree that, you know, if I'm like, let's say here, I can't go out, right? All I can do is move along the circle, so I have to move tangent to the circle the whole time? Keep that in mind. Now, let's bring f in. So here's f. Now, f looks a lot like g, but they're not the same. Here's g. If I put g up there together, you can see they're not the same, right? You can see that they're not the same function. So uh, there's f. Now, take all the points on this circle, map them up into f, and you get a curve. So here's the curve, that blue curve. And I'll pull this out. And we talked about this last time. We looked at it from the top. We said, okay, if you... Actually, if you look at right from the top, you can see that the blue curve is laying right on top of that green circle. Y'all still there? We happy? Okay, I'm going to pull, pull F out of the picture a little bit more. We are interested in finding those four points, one, two, three, four, those max and mins, right? Now, because, again, um, F is a function, and this blue curve lives on that function, there are gradient vectors at every point on that blue curve, aren't there? Gradient vectors? Now, I'm not gonna pull them, I'm, I'm gonna pull them in a second, but um, in the very beginning of th this chapter 11, we talked about surfaces. We said you can, um, or actually it was 10.6 when we were doing quadratic surfaces, and I said you could graph them by hand, and you have to do these level curves where you, you draw like, okay, it's a circle, a circle, a circle, 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 okay, that's a cylinder. Or if you have like parabola, parabola all the way down, then, you know, you get this like paraboloid. Remember that? And I said, forget that. We have a computer. We can do it. Well, let me just bring into the picture level curves. So here are the level curves of this elliptic paraboloid. So at every level, go up one, there's a curve. Go up two, there's a curve. So I got all these, they're all ellipses, okay? Now, if you look at those ellipses from the top view, they look like this. And the red represents the gradient. So if I'm standing, let's say, about right here on, the, on that level curve, some level curve over here, I'm standing there, then the gradient is that direction, the red direction. We have to now kind of make sure we understand what the gradient represented, though. The gradient was always... The gradient always told you the direction you need to point, that if you step in that direction, you will increase the most rapidly. It gives you the direction of maximum rate of change, doesn't it? So if I'm sitting here on a level curve, that arrow right there tells me that if I walk out in that direction, I will be going up the steepest ascent. So it would almost be like I'm standing right here. I try and go out, which forces me up, right? I go in, it forces me down. Y'all still okay with that? So all those red ones are our gradients on the level curves. And then what you'll see also, you've got that circle that's on the ground. You've got the, the what's this? Gradient of what? G, right? And I have one specific level curve that I kind of highlighted here in yellow that you can see right here. All right? Notice that where that level curve hits the blue, it also hits the green. That's not a coincidence. All right. Let me bring in the gradient of F. Here's the gradient of F. It's a blue vector. It's sticking out here. I'm just going to kind of swing it around so you can see it here. See it here? Come back here. I lost it. <laughs> I moved it all the way around. There it is. I lost it again. Okay, there's, there it is. Now, but if we look at it from the top, here's what that one looks like. So please understand, the blue vector lives on the blue curve, and it's telling us if I'm standing on the blue curve, which is somewhere over here, and I want to go up the fastest, I need to go in that direction. The green one is the gradient of the constraint. Notice that what this says to me right now is that if I want to go to a higher point, I must follow that blue vector, right? But I have to live on this circle. And that means I cannot go out that direction, can I? 
this blue vector is telling me I need, you know, if you look at it kind of like components, screw it, I have two components. I have it like an, almost like an X and Y component of that blue vector. It's telling me to go there, I have to go out and over, right? I can't go out. So my best option is to just do what? Go over. Go over means move a little more to, to the left on that curve. So let me just move to the left a little bit. Okay, I move to the left. What is the blue vector telling me? I still need to move. If I want to go somewhere and get higher, higher, not higher. Don't look at me like that. If I want to get higher, right, then I need to keep moving to the left a little bit. Keep moving to the left, right? Now look at where we are. It's hard to see it over here, but look at where we are. Where, what am I getting closer to over here? That max. Now, this is still telling me move to the left if you want to go a little higher. Still, now, it's starting to come closer, right? But it's still telling me I need to move to the left a little bit. Move to the left, a little bit more. Move to the left. Now, here, what is it telling me? If I want to go higher, I have to go out. I can't go out. I'm constrained, right? I have to live on the green. So at this point, if I... If I want to go any higher, I have to step off my constraint, which I'm not allowed to do. But notice that the green and the blue are parallel. That's what this means, right? Two vectors are parallel if they're scalar multiples. The gradient of F is a scalar multiple of G. They're parallel. Where this happens is where you have maximums and minimums. Now, I'll pull it around because this is where we had a max, right? The min is going to happen over here. Oh, also notice, isn't this, isn't this point where one of my level curves intersected one of my, or my constraint, where they intersect each other? Pull it back over here. Now, what I also did here, and I haven't mentioned it, was, does anyone see that pinkish looking vector? That's the, that's my gradient, my blue but pointed the other direction. So the pink one, the blue one tells me go that direction for maximum ascent. The pink one tells me go that direction for maximum descent, right? So if you look at it that way, it's telling me from this point, if I want to go down, then which way do I go? This way, right? Move, I, I can't go in, right? I'm stuck on the circle. So I got to go this way. So I keep on going, moving, Moving, moving. It's still telling me to keep moving kind of to the right until I get right there. Now it's saying at this point, if you want to go down further, you've got to go straight in. And I can't. I'm stuck on the constraint. But if I go past it, it tells me, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You can go lower if you go back to the right. So I was at a minimum at that point. Oh, and they're parallel, obviously. It was hopefully obvious that they were parallel. So that is a, that is a very sketchy explanation. It's the best we can do visually to show you why Lagrange works. Now, to show why it works for functions of three variables, four variables, five variables, n variables, much more difficult, something we can't even really attempt in, in a class like this. But at least we have some geometric foundation to believe it's true, at least in this case. All right? Not even close to how long that would, I thought that would take. Okay. Uh, another thing. At the end of 11 last time, I didn't look at two things. We got through all that. I showed you what the bonus was. I told you, oh, this is going to be on the test, right? Multiple constraints. On the mini exam, I'm not going to give you an example of that. But at the very end of this was a homework assignment, and then I have this. Did that print out on yours? And you probably wonder what that was. This is actually, if anyone wants this, you'll have to come get it and bring a flash drive. This is actually code that I wrote where you can do, <clears throat> you can do Lagrange problems. So like, for example, What's the function that we just had? It was uh, x squared plus 2y squared, right? That was, that was f. Then you come down here. Yes, I want to enable. What was the g constraint? It was x squared plus y squared. I'm referring to the first example from 11.8, right? 
it was x squared plus y squared. What was my constant? What was the constraint? Equals 1. And then all you do is hit this little button up here, and it goes through and it solves x, y, lambda, x, y, lambda, x, y, lambda, gets them all. And then it gives you, it actually calculated the function's value at that point. So I have two mins and two maxes. And I, I wrote the code for that. I did it for a function of, of three variables, one constraint, and a function of three variables with two constraints. So if you're interested in this, you have to download, remember, you have to have that CDF player, but you can download this and then just, you can use it. Not on a test, like in class, but. All right. Chapter 12. Okay, who does not have the notes from last time? I handed out the notes. I know I need to get a couple. Any? Okay, one, two. That's it? Just two? What did you all think of that Lagrange ex explanation? Does that make sense? I mean, did that kind of make sense at all? Okay. When I learned Lagrange, it was never explained. So, and I don't think I've ever been asked like why it works, but so it was actually fun for me to try and figure out a way to explain it in a way that would make sense. Okay, we are getting in chapter 12, all right? We're done with 11. Chapter 12, we start what are called multiple in integrals. So we're back to integration. And let me get grab my notes so I can make sure you're we're in the same place here. Multiple integrals. And we're going to start with uh, section one, which is titled double integrals. Thank you. Now I put here in Cal one, we learned about the Riemann sum, but that's not always true. How many of you actually did learn Riemann sums? Hmm? Some of you are like, I don't know if that means you don't know, you just don't want to look like you didn't. Riemann sums, you'll know once I show you this, whether or not you learned Riemann sums or not. The idea was basically that if we want to find the area under a curve, you just add up a bunch of rectangles. And then what you do is you let that go to infinity. And if you do that, the sum of the rectangles actually becomes, the sum sign becomes an integral sign. And then you get this formula. So that's what we did in Cal 1. I have a picture here. You know, here's, here's some rectangles. If we add up the, the area of those rectangles, we get an approximate area. And this, this actually computes it. Here's the actual true area underneath this blue curve. And then there's the estimated area with those rectangles. And the idea from Cal 1 was that if we add, if we make it more rectangles, our estimated area starts to approach the value of the true area. And it gets closer and closer and closer. And basically, it's a sequence. So for Cal 2, you study sequences and series. It's a sequence of numbers and a sequence which converges to the true area. So the way to get the true area is to let the number of these things go to infinity. Now, how many of you saw Riemann sum? Okay. Now, see if that's it for that, yeah. Oh, this little thing, you can switch to different examples and whatever. Well, we don't need that. All right. But there's some very subtle things that we need to pick up now that, w that were from Cal 1 that we're going to use now, things that maybe we just kind of forgot about or didn't think about. First of all, when we had the, the area under a curve, we always went from one point to another, like from A to B usually, right? From A to B. And then when we were trying to find the area of that rectangle in there, we picked some, some arbitrary rectangle. So we picked some X. We called it like X sub I. It's just like the I point somewhere in there that was somewhere in the, the rectangle. We picked that point, and then we look at a, like a little... Uh, width to that rectangle, which we call delta x. Okay, that's what we had. 
And then over here in the picture, here's that same thing. There's our number line. There's our AB. There's our little width, which we call DX. Okay, delta X was used at first, and then once we let the number of rectangles go to infinity, it becomes DX, the differential instead of just change in X. So this represents that little change. The height of the rectangle was the function evaluated at that point. And I don't know if you remember that this, but uh, the point that you pick in that rectangle can be any point. It doesn't have to be the left point or right end point or midpoint. It can be any point in there because in the end, they're going to become infinitesimally small in, in terms of width. So it's going to converge to a single point anyway. So we pick that. So the area of that one rectangle, right, the area is approximately the height times dx. Yes? Just the area of that one little rectangle. Then what we do is we say the area is the limit as we let the number of rectangles go to infinity. So that's what this means. We're adding up all those rectangle areas until it goes to infinity. That turns into the integral sign from A to B, f of x dx. The key here, f of x is actually coming from this, right? The f of x sub i, and the dx is actually this, right? So that's your height, that's your width. Do I have two of the same exact pictures? Yes, I do. Or I delete that. Now what we're going to do is instead of looking at areas, we're going to be looking at volumes under a surface. So now we get into what the Cal 3 stuff is. The concept is the same. You have a surface, which is here. We're trying to find the volume under it until you hit the xy plane. So what we do is instead of add, adding up rectangles, we add up these rectangular boxes, or call them parallel pipeds, but that's just technical name for a box. So we have a box, a bunch of boxes. The more boxes we have, right, the more boxes we have, the more accurate our volume becomes. This kind of slows the computer down, so I have to take it piece by piece. See, now we're starting to get really close to the true volume. This is not a very good approximation, right? So we want to take, again, the limit as these things go to infinity. Do you see how it's just the same concept? The question now becomes, what does the formula look like? In the, in the previous, in Cal 1, it was f of x dx. f of x was the height. DX was the width. So now all that happens is this. First, what we do is we say, what's our domain? Instead of it being in the number line, it's actually in two-dimensional space. So not only will we have AB, we will also have some height to that rectangle, which will be uh, CD. And we will label that region R, but the R stands for rectangle, OK? We have a rectangular region. Uh, you'll see me, you'll see me um, denote that later on as this. It'll be in your notes, but I'll just point it out now. That region R is equal to AB cross CD. Now, that's not a cross product, okay, because these aren't vectors. But that's a notation that you'll see me use. This means this is a number line. On a number line, this is a closed interval, right, AB? And this is a closed interval, CD. So this is AB cross kind of cross. It's in that sense, CD. So it's where AB and CD come together. OK, any questions right now? Now, if I take a look at that region on the ground, that's what it looks like over here, right? And then if I take that little yellow rectangle inside, and I look at a little tiny rectangle, then the width of it is your change in x, and then this height of it over here is your change in y. So now all we need to find the volume of it, if we know the length and the width, right, or length and height, however, whatever I said, we just need to know how high it is, right? And the height of it is the function, the function's value at that point. Now the point that I picked in here was actually had an x and a y, so we call the point x, xi and yi. 
plug that x, y, i, y into, into the function, and we get a height. Yes? So the total volume is going to be what happens when I add all those rectangles up, all of them. So what I have to do is what's called a double sum. I have to sum basically all the rectangles down one direction and then sum all the rectangles down the other direction. And so we call it a double sum. So it'll be the double sum of the function height times, the you could say, the length and the width or something like that. And if you convert that and let the number of them go to infinity, what you get is a double integral, two sums, right? Two sums, f of x, y, which is your height, and then dx, dy, which was like your length and width. You see the connection between Cal 1? I don't know why I have duplicates of the same thing here. But that's what the volume would be, a double integral. Questions? All right, so here's our formal definition here. The volume between a function, a surface, and the xy plane. Now, I point out here, what is the xy plane as an equation? Z equals 0. So you're saying we have a surface, and we have the xy plane, which is z equals 0, the volume under it, over some rectangle, a B, C, D, A, B cross with C, D is given by the double integral, and look at this notation, double integral over R. So this R here tells you you're integrating over this some rectangle. The rectangle is defined to be this. And then notice that F of X, Y didn't change, right? But what is this? D, A. D, A. D is basically the infinitesimal area. DX, was, DX used to mean um, infinitesimal width, right? Cal 1, number line AB, infinitesimal width, that was DX, right? Cal 3, we have an infinitesimally small little thing there. That's DX, DY, isn't it? We just call DX, DY, DA, like an infinitesimal area. So what it is, look at this double integral. It's the integral from A to B, then integral from C to D of the function dy dx, or it's this, which is exactly the same on the left side of the equation. What's the difference in this, this other d double integral? The integrals are swapped. So these are different, right? Instead of A to B, then C to D, it's C to D, then A to B. What else is different? The dx dy is different. Now, you'll see how this is going to play out, but this is the definition for us for, for double integral right now. It does. Yep, it will matter. Okay, so here's what we have, iterated integrals. So what do those integrals mean? When we see double integral that goes A to B, then C to D, and then here's our function, dy dx, what that means is this. There's almost like a hidden parentheses right there. And that hidden parentheses separates what we call the inner, inner integral from the outer integral. So on the inner integral, notice what are we differentiating, or sorry, what are we integrating with respect to on the inner integral? What's our variable? Why? What are these limits? C and D, those, those were Y's, weren't they? Okay. And then the outer integral has X out here as our variable. And notice A and B are X values. Those must be, um, those must coincide. Your Y's must go with your C, D. Your X must go with your A, B. So inner integral, when we evaluate the inner integral, we're going to do an antiderivative. Okay? An antiderivative, we're going to do it with respect to Y because there's a Y there, isn't there? That means that, what, what do we do with X? We treat X like a constant. So it's like we did when we did partial derivatives. There were those problems where I gave you acceleration. You had to go back to velocity and, and position. We treated certain things as constants. Here, 
we will treat x like a, a constant when we do the antiderivative here. Once we get that antiderivative, we will integrate with respect to x and treat y as a constant. All right? You'll see how it works out, but that's, that's it written down. I'll refer back to it if we need it. Now, if we change the order, right? If I do C, D, A, B, F, and notice the, notice the inner integral here, dx is first, a and b are on that one, and then the dy is on the outside. So when we do that inner integral, we will treat what as the variable and what as the constant on the inner one. x is the variable, y is the constant. All right? And then on the outer one, treat y as the variable. Example. So we have a function here, a surface, right? I want to find the volume under it on 0, 2, 0, 2. So there's 0, 2, 0, 2. There it is. Then we have some surface sitting there above it. Right? There's my surface. And all I want is to take basically that rectangle, map it up into the surface like that, and then look at everything below it. And then take that surface out of there. We want that volume right there. Right? That's what we want. What's the volume of that solid? So let's go ahead and set it up. This will be our first double integral. So I'll write down the function. We have f of x, y equals 16 minus x squared minus 2y squared on 0, 2, 0, 2. So I'm going to set the integral up first. I'm going to do the double integral. And I'm going to do my function here, and I'm going to do the iterated integral. I'm going to go dy dx. I could have done dx dy, but I'm going to do dy dx. Now, if I do it that way, the inner integral is this one, right? There's my inner. And the outer one has the x's in it. So what are my limits of integration on this integral then? What's, what's the one on the outside? Zero, two. Well, they're going to be the same, aren't they? So you can't really get it wrong here. But these are the x's, right? Zero, two are the x's. And then the zero, two on the inside are the y's. Yes. These are the x's. These are the y's. Always. So in other words, this is A, B, this is C, D. Does that answer your question? Okay. So in this one, this is B, this is A, this is D, this is C. Let's look at the inner integral. So I'm going to do the inner first. And you can do it all at one time, or you can do it separately. You want to do it all at one time? No? You just keep the, you keep the outer integral there, and inside the brackets, you work out the, in, the inner one. You just keep bringing it line to line to line. But I'm going to just do the inner one, then come back to, and plug it in. So the inner one is the integral from 0 to 2 of 16 minus x squared minus 2y squared with respect to y. And now, this is a pretty clean antiderivative here. Because it's just three terms, right? The antiderivative. Not derivative. Antiderivative. What is the antiderivative of 16 with respect to y? That's the derivative. 16y. What's the antiderivative of negative x squared? Negative x squared y. Why? Why is that that? Because x, negative x squared is being treated as a constant because we're integrating with respect to y. So this may, have, this may, as, well, may as well have been another 16. 
and the antiderivative would have been 16y. So that's this. And then what's the antiderivative of, ne of negative 2y squared? Negative 2 thirds y cubed. Now that one required the power rule for antiderivatives. Agreed? Yes? Evaluated from where to where? 0 to 2. But what's going to be 0 and what's going to be 2? The bottom one is 0, the top one is 2, but what are we plugging that in for? For y, right? So a good thing to get into the habit of doing is instead of writing 0 and 2 on that line, put y equals 0, y equals 2. That way you don't forget that you're, you're going to substitute those values in for y, not x. Does that make sense? Equals, okay, now this will give us two separate things, won't it? Something minus something. I'm just using the fundamental theorem of calculus here, right? Plug in 2 for y, figure out what that is, then minus whatever you get when you plug in 0 for y. Oh, the 0 for y is easy, isn't it? That one, 0 for y is easy. How about 2 for y? What do we get? 32 minus 2x squared minus 16 thirds, right? What's 32 minus 16 thirds? Because those are both constants, right? What is it? 80 thirds? Does everyone agree with that? Any questions? That's just the inner integral, right? It's just the inner one. So now what I need to do is I need to go back up and basically this part in here is going to be replaced with this, what we just got. So here's where I am now. Integral 0 to 2, but I'm replacing the inside with 80 thirds minus 2x squared d what? dx. Now we're going to try and find the antiderivative of this with respect to x, which is 80 thirds x minus 2 thirds x cubed evaluated from, and now I don't really need to say it, but x equals 0 to x equals 2. It's just I'm going to start getting into a habit of, of saying what it is I'm plugging in because it's going to start to become important, you know, and you're going to, when we get to triple integrals and you have x, y, z, you need to make sure, yeah, you need to make sure you're, you know what you're plugging in for. And there's going to be a time where we're not going to be plugging in constants. We're actually going to be plugging in functions. So it'll get even worse. <clears throat> no, that'll be today, maybe, if we have enough time. Don't know. It'll just depend. I've, I've talked a lot. Okay, at this point, could you get that? Is it easy? Uh, 48? Okay, I'll trust that we've got the answer 48. So the volume is 48. The fact that it turned out to be an integer is just nice. It's not, I mean, don't expect integer answers all the time, okay? What do you all think, though? As far as the method is concerned, okay? Did you do dx, dy, and you got the same answer? Huh, I wonder if it will always work that way. Well, here's, uh, I'll skip one note ahead. I won't do example two for right now. Um, Fubini's theorem says that if f is a continuous function on a rectangle, that the integrals are the same. So it doesn't matter if you did the, if you chose your inner integral to, to go with x first, right, a to b and then x, or if you go inner integral to be y first, then do x later, as long as you're over a rectangle, this is key, you have to be over a rectangle, and f must be continuous, which means it's just well-behaved, 
then you can go either direction. Uh, how do you mean? Oh, yeah, it wouldn't work if you're not over a rectangle. Yeah. If you're over a triangle, then we're in 12.2. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> if what? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yes. No, no, no. Look at what this thing says is that you, it basically says you can do your inner integral can be the X with the AB, then do Y with the CD, or you can do Y with the CD and X with the AB, but you cannot do Y with the AB and X with the CD. Yeah, the A's and B's have to stick with X, and the Y's have to stick with C and D, or the Y has to stick with C and D, but the inner and outer can be interchanged. So the, what we say is the order of integration doesn't matter when, when integrating over a rectangle. Let's look at this example. I'll back up one. Find the volume under y sine x, y. This is a good example. So here's the surface. Here's the range of it. So you plug in the stuff on the rectangle. Here's the volume. I'll take the surface out of here. And what you'll notice is that you have parts of the Parts of the solid are below the xy plane. Parts are above, right? So parts that are below are actually going to be counted as negative volume. Parts above are going to be counted as positive volume. Just like in Cal 1, you had whenever your function was above the x-axis, it was counted as positive area, and below it was negative, right? So like in Cal 1, if you took the sine function, sine x, and you integrated um, sine x, from 0 to 2 pi, you would get an answer of 0, wouldn't you? And that's because that positive area canceled out that negative area. Well, the same sort of thing happens here with these integrals. The volumes can cancel out. Now, do they? I don't know. We have to figure this out. So let's, let's determine our rectangle. I'm going to go to my... f of x, y equals y sine x, y. My rectangle here is 1, 2, and 0 pi. I'll label these. That's a, b. That's c, d. Now, is this a continuous function? Yeah, OK. Let's try this. I'm going to go for uh, inner integral being y and outer integral being x. Let's just try it, see what happens. So I'm going for this. OK? Now, inside is just the surface itself. Okay with that? What are my limits of integration here? Starting from the outer integral. 1 to 2 and then 0 to pi. Since so we what? That's exactly why I'm giving you this example. Let's see what if it would have mattered, right? Okay, so if this is my inner integral, right? Let me take a look at that inner one over here. 0 to pi, y sine xy dy. So in that integral, I'm treating what is a constant? The x. That means I have to find the antiderivative of y 
sine xy. So it's already been recognized that, that it can be done, but it's going to require integration by parts, correct? Integration by parts. So I don't know, maybe that would work. Maybe, I mean, we could do integration by parts, right? We're all Cal 3 students, so. But perhaps doing it the other way would be better. This one I would go dx dy, right? So my inner one here would look like integral 1 to 2. Uh, y sine xy dx. Now here I'm treating y like a constant, right? So I don't even have to worry about that y, and the y in front of the x is, is, it doesn't matter either. So all you really have to know is what's the antiderivative of sine of yx? Negative cosine xy, but then 1 over, you have to take out scale, so you have to take out a a y also 1 over y, or 1 over, not 1 over y, is it, oh yeah, yeah, 1 over y, because y is our constant. So let me put this down here so you can see. If I asked you what's the antiderivative of sine of 4x dx, it would be negative, one, negative 1 fourth cosine of 4x, because you, you have to scale by what's in here in front. That might be a, tr a trip up. Uh, spot for you. You know, how comfortable are you um, treating y as a constant here and finding the antiderivative sign? But it's a lot better than the integration by parts that we would have had to have done. So let me let me bring this over here. This is going to be equal to. Okay, so what's the antiderivative here? Negative cosine xy. What the hell happened to that thing I said I was going to scale by? cancel with the y that was in front already, right? Okay. And that's going to be evaluated from what to what? From what's what to what? x is equal to 1 to x is equal to 2. Now you can check this for yourself. Take the derivative of this with respect to x and you should get this. Plug in 2, you get negative cosine 2y, right, minus, now plug in 1, you get negative cosine of y, which turns out to be cosine y minus cosine 2y. Then you can go plug that in. To the inner to the outer integral so I I think the moral of the story here is that we did not do the the first order because it, it required integration by parts we've we've gone this route because the integration was a little easier so let's go into the outer one now it was integral from 0 to pi of cosine y minus cosine 2y um, D y, right? Antiderivative of cosine y, sine y. Antiderivative of cosine 2y, minus 1 half sine 2y. Evaluated from uh, yeah, 0 to pi. Plug in pi, sine of pi is 0, sine of 2 pi is 0. So 0 in the beginning, minus, plug in 0, gosh, all that for nothing, literally, right? So they, they wiped, the volumes wiped each other out. What would be extremely interesting here is to try and attack this problem, like back here, with the sine problem from Cal 1, we could actually figure out the total area of this if we did, if we first went from 0 to what? Pi, right? 
got that area, and then went from pi to 2 pi, and then got that answer and, and made it positive, or just double them because it's symmetric. But you, what you had to do in order to be able to do this is you had to find the x-intercept, right? You had to know where it hit the x-axis. Well, to do something similar here, we would actually have to know I'm so sick of this thing. We would have to know what where that surface what intersects the the xy plane which is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Let me see here. I know. See, we would have to know where that went below. So you would have to set y sine xy equal to 0 and solve. That'd be a, a little bit of a challenge. Well, but even the absolute value of that wouldn't work. Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, you'd have to be able to integrate it. That would be the trouble for us. Right? Because, yeah, <laughs> well, you're right. You're right. Um, all right, here we go. Fubini's theorem we just looked at. Verify Fubini's theorem. All, I'm not going to do this one, but all it says is if you do this problem both ways, right, inner integral one way, inner integral the other way, you get the same answer. What I will do is I will, I will set up the integral so you can just at least see what the two different integrals would look like. Okay, let me see if I can do this without. So one integral would look like this. I would go 0 to 1, 1 to 2. You tell me, xy squared what? D what? DY, DX. Okay? Or we could do integral, integral 1 to 2, 0 to 1, XY squared, DX, DY. Either way, you work those out, you should get the same result. All right? You, you'd be given those. You'd be given R. DA will always be either DX or DY, DX, DY, or DY, DX. But it's really important for us to understand the whole DA thing because let me show you why. Let me try and, again, not go too far off. But here's my chapter, where is it? Chapter 13 summary. So we're not in Chapter 13 yet, but I want you to look at all these integrals that we have here. This one has ds, okay? Uh, ds, dt, hold on. Here we go. dr, here r is a vector. Here dt, here there is no d, anything. Here dr, here dr. Okay, so what I guess I'm getting at is all these integrals, here has a dx, dy, all of these integrals, here's a da, they all have that little d whatever represents something. In Cal 1, you're kind of like, well, dx is just the difference. It's just kind of like tells you what the variable is. But, for, but in here, that d whatever means everything to us. It, it tells us exactly what it is we're working on. So we need to get our head around it right now and start getting used to understanding what it is. So that when we get to this, it won't uh, freak you out. That's shit, right? Oh my God. DS, DR. Yeah, I'm going to print this out for you. Oh, that one over there, because it was a dot product of two vectors. And when you dot them, one of them was a tangent vector. And when you dot that, what will what will spit out is an arc length. 
and you'll be you'll be different you'll be integrating with respect to arc length. You'll see it's it's too early right now. Is that actually about 20 minutes from now. Oh, just kidding. Okay, here are some properties of the double integral. These are just things that we need to make sure that we're aware of, but we can never assume these to be true because they we just think they are. These are properties that are given to us. If you're integrating over double integral over a rectangle of the sum of two functions or difference of two functions, you are allowed to split it into two separate double integrals, which is very similar to what we did in Cal 1, right? Only over rectangles uh, for right now, only over rectangles. Okay. Now, if you have a constant next to a function trying to get a double integral over a rectangle, you pull that constant out, that's okay also. Then this one kind of makes sense. If, if a function is always bigger than another function, right? F is always bigger than G. For every X and Y in some rectangle, then when you take the double integral, that means you add up the volume underneath it, that volume should be more than the volume of the other one because the other one was always below it or equal to it. So that should be the relationship between the volumes. Well, if you had another function on the other side, then you could say that, you know, these, if these two double integrals go to the same place, then the one in the middle does. But this is just a general relationship between two. Now, the book doesn't really talk about this too much in this section, but I threw it in here because I think now is a good time for you to see this. Up to this point, we've been talking about the volume under a surface to the, to the xy plane, right? And I said earlier, the xy plane is really z equals zero. But we can actually find the volume between the surface and another surface. Doesn't have to be the xy plane. It can be another surface if we look at this picture here. So first of all, let's say we're given two surfaces, f and g. We have a rectangle. Then if we take the f, subtract the g, which is just break it into two separate double integrals, then what that represents is this. You have this surface on top, right? You have a surface on the bottom. They are both restricted to this rectangle, so that rectangle came up like this. And you're looking at the volume between the two instead of all the way down to the xy. Yes? Got your little rectangle AB, here's CD. Y'all all see that? Okay. I've got another copy of it. I, I don't know why it doesn't. I think I'm at the end. I have a homework assignment. No, wait, I'm not at the end, am I? Am I? Wait a minute, what about 12.16? Did I just like blow over it? Yeah. No. Where is 12.16? Back? Oh, wow. How did I get over that so quick? Okay. Well, no, Fabini's theorem I did do, right? I skipped over the special case. I'm sorry. And I skipped over an example, didn't I? There's a video of what? Oh, that problem being worked? Yeah, okay. I didn't do this, right? Okay. All right. Look, this is a special case. doesn't happen very often, but we should be able to recognize it when it does. If your function of x and y happen to be able to be separated as the product of two functions that are both independent of one another. In other words, the variables here, right, g is some function of x and h is some function of y, and they're separated by multiplication, then what you can do, and this only can happen when you can separate them, is you can take that double integral and you can split it <coughs> into the product of two integrals. It's the only time it's ever allowed. But you have to be able to split the two. Let me show you the example. Look at this one right here. Our function f has sine of x, right? Sine of x has nothing to do with y right now, does it? We have cosine of y has nothing to do with x. They're separated by multiplication. Therefore, we can split this into two separate integrals. 
Now, what are the limits on the integral for sine x going to be? 0 to the pi over 2 from this x right here. What are the limits on the cosine y going to be? Well, it's going to still be doubles. This double becomes two what? Singles? C A B C D. Two doubles become two single or single ah, a double becomes uh two singles. So could we have done that earlier? How about on this one? Could we have done it? Yes, because these are separated. Now I didn't you didn't know that then, but now you see you could. How about this one? No. Because even though the y is its own, this xy is trapped in sine, and there's no way I can split that off into two product. So we couldn't have used that special case. Uh, yes. Yes. It, it will generalize, but I don't remember ever seeing an example of it. So I'll just set this one up. And again, I won't work through it. It would have been double integral over a rectangle uh, sine x cosine y. I'll say dA is equal to, and we had this, this was our was 0 pi over 2, 0 pi over 2. So because I can split these up, it should turn into integral 0 to pi over 2 sine x dx times integral 0 to pi over 2 cosine y dy. Those are pretty easy to do, right? What's the antiderivative of the sine? negative cosine x evaluated from 0 to pi over 2 times sine y evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. What's this one? What's cosine of pi over 2? Cosine of pi over 2 is... Cosine is 0, right? So 0, and then what's uh, cosine of 0? 1, but then it's negative, but then we're subtracting, so that should be 1 times, now what's sine of pi over 2? 1, and then what's sine of 0? Zero? 0, so that should be 1. So that should be 1. Sine of 0. Where? Here? Yeah, but remember, this means I do negative cosine of pi over 2, then minus right negative cosine of zero yeah okay. so negative negative would become your positive all right uh i think that's it then for that section man it's only 205 it's just making good time here's the homework assignment that you should look at for that we're going to keep going today just don't get too excited <laughs> uh, homework Hey, the more time we have in Chapter 13, the better for you. Because if we have to rush through 13, you're not going to be happy. I want you to rewrite every every one of those pages by hand, please. Uh, homework. What? I don't even know what page it's on, but it's out of Chapter uh, 12, Section 1, 12.1. All right, who has a book? Someone have a book? Let me see a book. I'm going to I'm going to pick a problem out of that section here. So I asked you I asked you to do 31 Okay, I'm going to look at number 32 just to give you an idea 
Uh, this is on page 699. 32 says, find volume of solid enclosed by Z equals 1 plus E to the X sine Y. x equals plus or minus 1, y equals 0, y equals pi, z equals 0. Thank you. Now what we need to keep in mind is that everything here lives in 3D, right? Everything here lives in 3D. z equals 1 plus e to the x sine y is a surface, isn't it? X equals 1 is X equals 1 is a plane, isn't it? It's a plane. It's parallel to the YZ plane. Okay? X equals negative 1 is another plane parallel to the YZ plane. And then Y equals 0 is the xz plane, right? And then y equals pi is another plane parallel to the xz plane. And then z equals 0 is the xy plane. All of those things enclose a region. What's the volume of it? So what we, what we should try and do first is see if, if we can get our head around geometrically, if this is x and this is y, can we get our head around what the region is? And right now, we're in this section. We know the region's got to be rectangular, right? So let me just draw where those planes hit the xy plane. x equals 1. That's right here, right? x equals 1 would look like a line like this. Now, the plane, it's a plane that goes up and down, right? But that's where it hits the xy plane. x equals negative 1 would be... On the other side, right? And it would look like this. I'm not going to draw through it, but it would go like that, right? Y equals zero. I'll label these. X equals negative one. X equals one. Y equals zero is this. And y equals pi, you know, let's say this is pi right here. Not drawn to scale, but that's what it would look like, right? Do you all see that? Now, I think it's good to be able to do it in 3D, but you could have done all of this in 2D. Here's 1, here's negative 1, here are my, here are my x's. Here's my Y's. Y'all follow this? Pardon me? Is Z equal to one more than? Yeah. Right now, we have this and we have this, right? So this is really just finding the volume underneath this, isn't it? Because that's the way I first introduced this concept, didn't I? So your question is, what if that wasn't zero? If it was z equals zero and z equals one, you would have a box. You would be integrating one. You, so you're, you'd have double integral, you would have one, and then you would have your same, you know, dA and you would basically get the volume of the box is what you get. That'd be kind of an interesting way to find the volume of a box to do a double integral, but you could do it. Okay, so let's try and set this up. What I want you to see is that you have an F function that's on top of a G function, all right? Something on top of the other. So my F in this problem 
is here. Okay, that F is on top. The bottom one is zero. So what will this double integral look like? Double integral. Uh, let's do the inside. What's the inside going to be? 1 plus e to the x sine y, right? Now I just have to choose because because Fubini's theorem, this is a continuous function on on our rectangle, I can go either way. So I'm going to just go with dy dx. Just I don't know, I have no idea why I chose that. And all that matters now is that I get everything else correct. My x restrictions are negative 1 to 1. My y restrictions were from 0 to pi, right? Do you all see that? I should have highlighted my region over here, or my rectangle. That's my rectangle right there. Right? That's R. Can you do what? You could actually, what you could do is first make this two double integrals. So do one here and then the other one over there. And then you could do that second integral, special case. You could do that. I'm not going to do the rest of this because I've set it up for you. But you understand what, what you would do now. So I'm going to make a quick copy of this uh, page. What I'd like to do is I'd like to see how would things change if I had done the same exact problem. I don't really need to erase all this, but I'm doing it just for, to give myself some room. <clears throat> okay, what if I had changed this to z equals x squared plus y squared. It'd be the difference between the two. However, would you want to resolve which is on top and which is on bottom? You know what I'm saying? It really doesn't. It, it, one way you might get a negative answer. So all you do is take, the, take it and change it to positive. So I guess that's the whole pr point I'm bringing up is that it really doesn't matter which one is on which one you call f and g. Just know that when your answer is negative, you actually need to return the positive answer instead. That means you got them backwards. You put the one on top on the bottom instead of the other way around. Well, the other option you could do that because that's ultimately what happens. It's two separate integrals separated by subtraction. Um, but you could try and figure out which one is on top by just plugging in some sample points or getting on a computer and graphing it. But this double integral would set up to be, you would have the 1 plus e to the x sine y minus then x squared plus y squared. So you have to subtract the whole thing there, right? So there's your f minus g. And then you could do same thing, Fubini's theorem, you could, you could do whichever order you wanted. So I'm just going to go RDA. All right, that's all I'll say about that section. Y'all all right? Y'all had a whole week off. I figured y'all would be like ready to roll. Excited. <laughs> roll back into bed. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Uh, 12.2. Now, 12.2, we're going to go slower because 12.2 rectangles are the easy, easy case. In fact, I don't think you'd ever see me ask, I don't think you'd ever see me ask you to integrate anything on a test over a rectangle. It's just too, it's too simple. But you got to, you've got to start there. You've got to start there, just get used to the integration, used to holding one variable constant, okay? Double integrals over general regions, general regions. So 
So we've seen that so far, right? We've seen that. And this was the general idea that we had at the end of it, right? We had that. Rectangle, function on top, function on bottom. But what if your rectangle is not a rectangle? What we'll have right now are what we're going to call type 1 and type 2 regions. So look at this first thing that we call a type 2 region. Now, let me, let me explain what this means. This means D is the region where all the points, X, Y, in it are such that your X is between A and B. So your X is between two constants. And that's a symbol for and. And your Y is between what? Two functions of X. So now your Y is no longer stuck between two constants. Your Y is determined by X. This is what a region like that looks like. It's like a Cal 1 region, isn't it? A, B, your X's are stuck there. Your Y's are stuck between some function of X and some other function of X. In this case, we call it a type 1 region, type 1. Yes? If F is continuous on a type 1 region, then the double integral over that D of f of x, y, dA is this integral right here, this double integral. Notice the order of things here. A to B is on the outside, dx on the outside. You are forced to make your x be on the outside. You have to do it that way. No Fubini's theorem here. It's not a rectangle. Your inner integral must be done with respect to y. You cannot switch the order. Got it? Everything's got to work that way. It's because y depends on x. And the other one, your y went between two numbers. didn't matter what was happening with x, right? Here it does. Further, if we're given two functions, right? Like at the end of the last section, two functions. We had one on top, one on bottom. Then the volume between them over a type 1 region is... Just the difference of the two, right? It's just the difference. So nothing new there. The only thing that's new is that these double integrals over D both look like what we had up there, where you have to do the outside A, B, the inside is the functions. But, but more importantly, look at what it looks like. This is what something like that looks like. So you've got your A, B here. Your X's are stuck between here. Your Y's are stuck between two functions. Oh, I need to scroll down just a little bit. There we go. We call it G1 of X is the bottom function. G2 of X is the top function. So that's that picture we had of the type 1 laid down on the ground, isn't it? Any questions with the picture, the visualization of it? Well, then we better do one. Yes. Yes, yes, yep. The only difference will be one of them has the F and the other one has, is it G? Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at this right here. <clears throat> Find the volume under Z equals X plus 2Y on the region bounded by Y equals 2X squared and Y equals 1 plus X squared. So what I did is I already graphed what this region looks like. All right, that's, that's y equals 2x squared, and then the other one is 1 plus x squared. Which one of, which one of these is 2x squared? The bottom one. Which one is 1 plus x squared? The top one. Where do they hit each other? Where do they intersect? Negative 1 and 1. You know that because of my picture. You're not going to be given my picture in a test. So how do you figure out what that looks like? How do you figure out where they hit? Those are all things we're going to have to address. Okay? 
we'll have to set them equal to each other and all that stuff. But that's all going to be groundwork we'll have to lay down before we do the integral. But this is just to get us lo looking at what, it, what we have here. Here's the region that we're integrating over. Is it a type 1? Yeah, because a, um, x is stuck between negative 1 and 1, right? Your y's are stuck between two functions of x. How do we check to see if some, something is a function? Good old school vertical line test, right? Vertical line test through that top one, it's, it's a function, right? The bottom one by itself is a function of x. Is it a function of y? No. Why am I telling you this? Because type 2 regions are the other way around. Type 2s are functions of y and not functions of x. So I'm just pointing this out now. These are both functions of x. They are not functions of y. Right. Take that region laid down on the ground. There it is. Plug all those points into, well, there's your surface. Plug all those points in to your surface. You get this little thing here, and then the solid underneath it is there. So we're trying to find the volume of this, this thing right here. Okay? Let's actually do the work now. I'm going to work it like I don't know anything about the pictures. This will be our, probably our last example. So f of x, y equals x plus 2y on the region bounded by y equals 2x squared and y equals 1 plus x squared. Now, I have no problem with you using a graphing calculator to help you figure these things out, all right? In fact, I encourage you to. I mean, everyone in here should know what those two look like. Everyone should know those are parabolas and all that. But still, when we get to polar integrals, where you're doing things over polar regions, you may not know what things look like, and so you might need the calculator. All right, so I'm going to start with a graph. I'm just going to try and find my region D. That's all I'm going to work on right now. And I should probably start with as straight a lines as possible. Okay, let me go for this first one. Y equals 2x squared. Well, I know, you know, 0, 0 lives on that, right? I could plug in, maybe plug in 1 into it. What do I get if I plug in 1? I get 2. And then if I plug in negative 1, I get 2 again, right? It's parabolic. Looks something like this. Whew, terrible. Gah. And then the other one I'll do in uh, green is 1 plus x squared. So if I plug in 0, I'm at 1. If I plug in 1, I'm where? At 2. I plug in negative 1, I'm at 2. And it's parabolic, and from the looks of it, it's going to do something like that. So I can tell just from the picture where they touch, right? But let's act like I didn't know where they hit each other. How would you figure out where they hit each other? Set them equal to each other. So let's set these equal. Let's find the intersection. So you set 2x squared equal to 1 plus x squared. Subtract x squared on both sides. Take square root of both sides. x is plus or minus 1. If x is 1, then y is 1. If x is negative 1, then y is 1. So those are your two points of intersection right there. Agree? How are you going to determine that this region here is type 1? I mean, you're just going to have to kind of look at it, right? Yes. Why 
Where did I put that? Uh, yeah, I have no idea where I put that. Thank you for catching that. Two, two. Y'all see that? I even have it on my graph. I don't know what the hell I'm doing up here. Uh, all right, what now? Um, I found the intersection. I look at my pictures. I'm trying to determine if they're type 1 or not. So right now we don't really know what type 2 is, so it's hard to compare. But here's the main thing. If, if your y's here are bounded between two functions, do you agree that they are? My y's are bounded between two functions of x. This would be my g1 of x. This would be my g2 of x. And my x's are bounded between two constants. So I can go from negative 1 to 1 on x and let my y's vary between those two. Why couldn't you do it the other way? Just out of curiosity, why couldn't you do it this way and say, oh, look, check it out. My, my y's are bounded between two functions, like this. Yeah, but isn't this red right here the same function as this one? Isn't it part of the same curve? So it, it's not between two functions, it's between a single function. So, I mean, th that's because that fails that vert vertical line test when you look at it sideways. We don't want to call it horizontal line test. We just It fails to be a function of y. We'll see when we do the next uh, next type, which will be next class how that one would work out with type 2. All right, are there any questions on this on this region? All right, the integral I want to set up now, it's going to be a double integral over this region D of x plus 2y dA. But because it's a type 1 region, I must do dy first, then dx. So dy, then dx. And that means my outer integral has the limits for your x, which are what? Negative 1 to 1. And my, my limits of integration on the inner integral are my two functions of x, which What's g1? What's the bottom one? 2x squared. So 2x squared comes down here. And up here on the top one, 1 plus x squared. Y'all see how that works? Well, no. Actually, it's not, because you would have to have symmetry of the function. That function isn't necessarily symmetric. L look at, well, the picture here. Is it symmetric? Mm, and that it doesn't. See, look at, look at what, uh, if I look at it from the side, like this. So what I've done is I'm looking down, like this is the y-axis, I'm looking down the x-axis, or no, I'm doing it the other way. This is the x-axis. Come down, here's y, right? If I, you're saying go from 0 to 1 and find the volume just under there and double it, but look at this side, does that look the same? Because the plane, the, the plane x plus 2y that we're finding the volume under, the surface, is not symmetric over the origin. That's why. So you would have to have symmetry of the surface in order to do that. It's a good question. Not much. Not much, yeah. In fact, I, I don't really even point it out to students to look for it, look for symmetry. It's harder to show that a function of two variables is symmetric over the origin, because there's different ways that you can be symmetric over the origin, right? Because your, sur your surface, you're in a 3D space. So you could be symmetric over, over a line, or you could be symmetric over anything going through the origin. I don't know if that makes sense. Over the, over the y-axis, over the x-axis. 
Okay, uh, let's let's set this integral up. I'm I'm running a little bit short on time, but I'm going to try and knock this thing out. Um, first thing I'm going to do is get that stupid keyboard thing off there. Is the inner integral, and the inner integral is integral two uh, x squared to one plus x squared of x plus two y dy. So I need to integrate with respect to y first. What's the antiderivative of x with respect to y? xy. What's the antiderivative of 2y with respect to y? y squared. I'm going to now evaluate that what? 2x squared and 1x squared, but what's going to be replaced with 2x squared and 1 plus x squared? y. Because I integrated with respect to y, right? So y is going to be replaced with 2x squared. Y is going to be replaced with 1 plus x squared. Yes? I'm out of room. <laughs> it is cool. I, I agree. Uh, now, what? Plug them in? So we're going to have two things, right? Something minus something. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. So first, replace all your y's with 1 plus x squared. So I get x times 1 plus x squared, then plus 1 plus x squared squared. Then minus, now I replace all my y's with 2x squared. So x times 2x squared plus 2x squared squared, which is just an exercise in, in expanding polynomials, right? x plus x cubed plus 1 plus 2x squared plus x to the fourth minus 2x cubed minus 4x to the fourth, which is, I'll try and put this in descending order here, negative 3x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 2x squared plus x, plus 1. Do you all agree with that? That's my inner integral. Why what? You see? Yeah. Now what we'll do is we'll integrate that with respect to x, and then we'll have our limits of integration negative 1 to 1. So now going back to the outer integral, integral from negative 1 to 1, from negative 3x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 2x squared plus x plus 1 dx. And then you, you could do the rest, right? That's the Cal 1 problem. Oh, Cal 2. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Forgot. Well, some Cal 1s get to that. Yeah. Just depends. Um, for those of you who own the TI-89 or anything in that the computer algebra system, your, your um, calculators can do double integrals. They can do double integrals. Um, but you have to know how to do it. It's not hard, but if how many of you have used a, a TI-89 or something like that to do an integral? Right? So you know the format. You type in the function comma x comma then your a and b. Well, what you do is integral comma, y is the variable, then instead of a and b, you type in your functions of x. And then it'll give you a general answer, and then you take that and integrate that with respect to x and put your two limits, negative 1 and 1. Or you can do it all in one line. It just depends. So if, you, if you're interested in seeing how to do it, I'll, I'd be happy to show you. Uh, they just have new versions of the 84 um, that, that are newer than the 89. The 89 is just... The brain is very different than the 84. So 
They still make 84s because not everybody needs a computer algebra system, and not every testing, not every test allows for a TI-89. So they still have a market for, for not having a computer algebra system. Okay, I think that that probably gets you to where you can at least get through the homework from 12.1. And I don't think I want to put anything else in your head right now. So do you want homework from 12.1 or 12.2? No? What, okay, what's due, what's due on Monday? Mini exam four. The rest of those four problems? Mini exam four is due Monday. And you should try some of this homework out of 12.1. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to take them as two different mini exams because they were separated by several weeks. So th that'll actually be mini exam five. Yes. Okay. Everyone have a good weekend. <laughs>